that if we get Menasha corrected and get the barrier built at Menasha, we will monitor what goes on both upstream and downstream from that barrier for a year. We think we're going to be doing it with US, uh, with uh, UWGB and a group from that area. So we're not just doing this and saying, hey, let's hope it works. We're going to monitor it. If it works at, at Menasha, our hope is that we can take some of that technology and move that technology to the rapid crush barrier and figure out a way to make that open that barrier again. Economically, we did us we had a study done uh, last, not this last summer, but the summer before, in 2017, by the by the U, uh, UW Oshkosh and by the person who did the imp, the impact the economic impact study for the EAA, and the gist of that is that an intact river system where Menashe is open, Rapid Crush is open, and the visitor center is built is worth about $290 million to this part of the world over a 10-year period. It would probably supply almost 8,000 jobs, and there would be almost $100 million worth of economic development. We're confident those numbers are, are pretty stable simply because the group that did it are the, is the same group that did the EAA, and the same process was used. So we're at a point now where as I say, we think we've done diligence, we've passed the report on, the DNR's had the report now for about three weeks. We aren't real sure when we're going to get an answer back, but we're going to press to get it back as fast as we can. If, in fact, uh, we get the okay to do, to build the barrier, uh, we're prepared to do that. We're not going to go to the state, we're not going to come to all of you and ask you to donate to do it. We collected $3.8 million when the authority was formed to open the river. We're going to take that $3.8 million and use it to build the barrier. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to give it to Jeremy. Jeremy's going to talk to you a little bit about the technology, the science, and the operation of the barrier. Thank you. Well, Tim covered an awful lot of information, and I know that you've been uh, talking with some of you uh, inside and outside of this room about different things tonight, so I'll try not to double up on what Tim has covered, and uh, we'll try to get through, I think we've got about 14 slides here, and there's a couple of videos that I think will do a really good job of explaining what, what we've been talking about. So at a glance, all the locks were restored at a cost of about $15 million between the, between the years of 05 and 15. Last summer alone, we had 18,000 people that were passengers that went through the lock system. Uh, 25 miles of river are currently navigable through the lock system, and we're going to have nine locks available again this year, just like we did last year, for, uh, for navigation. <clears throat> Tim talked about the, net, about the uh, economic impact study that was done by David Fuller of the UW Oshkosh in 2017. And on the screen, you can see the actual numbers that Tim was quoting over a 10-year period, and that's with Menasha and with the crush open. <clears throat> that's a pretty substantial amount of money when you're talking about $290 million, $176 million in additional labor income, and almost, you know, 6,300 or 6,500 additional jobs, as much as $99 million in additional business investment. <clears throat> so if you look around what's going on, like, uh, for example, River, River Heath, down by Lock 4, is a perfect example of uh, something that uh, could develop along, you know, the entire river system, along the entire riverway that we've got in the Fox Valley here. So, not that we want hotels and restaurants at every square inch, but it's an example of where there's been a very deep impact uh, when it comes to economic input right in our backyard here. It's a good example. This is a picture of the round goby. This is the little bugger that we're all trying to uh, uh, develop a plan to keep, to keep out of uh, Lake Winnebago. Tim did say that it was closed in 2015 and we voluntarily uh, closed it at the request of the DNR. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about whether or not there's goby that's in Lake Winnebago yet. And at this point in time, there's been nothing confirmed. And we are told that the DNR has been testing, or fishing, or 
you know, trying to, to uh, figure out if there is goby in Lake Winnebago. At the same time, we're doing the same thing with our own independent folks that are doing that study. And Tim mentioned Lawrence University was doing it, and we're about to enter into a new contract with uh, UWGB to do that function for us. Here is a very good schematic, if you can see it. Um, <clears throat> this is what the layout will be for the electronic barrier. So here is the, ed, the uh, cul-de-sac at the end of Broadway. And these hash lines would be a sidewalk, uh, wide enough that you could drive probably a small uh, mini truck down or a forklift down or you know side-by-side -side UTV, ATV. And uh, this gray area here is just south of the lower gate or the uh, north, north gate. It's north of the lower gate, but it's actually, as you know, you know, the Fox River flows north. So it comes out of the Lake Winnebago and it flows down in elevation down to the Bay of Green Bay. So this is actually the downriver door. So the electronic barrier would be just downriver of a downriver door. Barrier is going to be about 100 feet long, and we're talking about 34, 33, 34 feet wide. These rectangles here signify where there would be existing docks for people to <coughs> queue up on, maybe unload, and take and walk over on the sidewalk and, and reload after they're boated and uh, passed through the, through the lock. Same thing on this side. We have a proposal for putting a sidewalk over here and then a dock up in this general area. So you could have two-way traffic to the locks. So people, if they wanted to get off their boat and go through, they could do that. If they wanted to stay in the boat, they could do that. And really nothing has changed when it comes to the process of going through a lock or doing a lockage. You know, right now we ask people to stay in their boats, you know, keep their hands and feet and obstacles or everything that they have inside the boat. We don't want them swimming. We don't want them fooling around in the water. We want them to stay in the boats. So really nothing has changed. You know, we're just going to want to make sure that people um, you know, abide by the rules and regulations, and we might ask that they put their PFDs on and personal flotation devices on when they go through the lock. So <clears throat> I guess uh, uh, a little bit further into the planning concept, if you think of the channel that's going to be put uh, below that uh, northernmost door, it's really a U-shaped channel, and that's going to be the 100-foot long channel that we've been talking about. And the electrodes will be embedded into the concrete. So it will create a smooth surface. So you won't actually see the electrodes. They'll be smooth because we don't want to have any edges that will catch uh, sediment or twigs or anything like that that could potentially cause a, a obstruction. So the whole concept here, and it's very important, is that that channel remains smooth and it's in a U-shape. UC <coughs> current and AC current, I don't know how many of you are electrical aficionados in here, but AC and DC are completely different, um, completely different from the spectrum of how it affects people and animals and water and just everything. So we've got a, a nice video that's coming up that should help explain that. Um, the gist of it is the DC current pulsates to stun the fish entering the channel, causing them to turn around and not to enter the lock. <coughs> so as they're envisioning this U-shaped channel and as they're trying to get up to the door, as they enter that channel, they'll start to feel resistance from the electronic, uh, resistance from the electronic barrier. As they increase or go a little bit <coughs> further into the channel, there'll be heavier resistance and more resistance, so it'll, it'll affect them more. So at some point, they might not be able to turn around and they'll just go to the bottom, but uh, we're, we're betting that uh, the studies that have been done show that as soon as they start to get the resistance, then they start to turn around and go back. Um, one of the other approaches that we're going to be using to uh, <coughs> keep goby uh, larvae and goby that are juvenile and the adult gobies out of the channel, in addition to the electronic barrier, is water velocity. So when you open up a lock and you flush the lock, you're taking about anywhere between 350 to 400,000 gallons of water and flushing it down that channel in about two and a half minutes or less. And that's a tremendous amount of water going through six small gates out the end of that lock gate. 
So uh, I believe we've uh, measured that, and the measurement is 10 times what an adult goby can withstand right now. Velocity. The velocity is 10 times of what an adult goby is. What, what an adult goby is. <laughs> I'm sorry. The maximum speed of an adult goby can withstand. So the barrier uses a pulse field of direct current in the water that is not dangerous to humans. And a lot of people, I, I know that have, have been, uh, the first thing they pick up on is electronic current in the water and they think of bad thoughts. A DC current and AC current are completely different things. Earlier this evening we were uh, attending the, uh, the board meeting and uh, there was some talk about stray current in marinas. Stray current in marinas are completely different animals. Because you have AC current in the water, not DC current in the water. So and I'm not going to try to sit here and explain stray voltage to you about a marina, but you, there has been, uh, there's, there's, there's stark differences. In that. <coughs> so we don't want to confuse that. DC current is much, much less. So uh, I believe uh, we're going to click on this video Talk about here. Pulsating issue first. Yeah, pulsed you current. Pardon me? Yeah, can you get sound on that for us, please? Great. One, one thing that, about the AC versus DC is that the AC current is 60 cycle current. The DC current we would use would be six cycles. So the, there would only be current in the water 3% of the time. And it's pulsating. It comes on and goes off, comes on and goes off. It's on for like three tenths of a second yeah. when it's on, so it, there's significant there's a significant difference in what happens. Okay, see that? Turn it up. Can you turn it up? Volume. 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 Nothing's going to be okay. Yeah, I was going to say that. The sound was coming out of the left. Hey, Windows P. Windows P on the here. Is it, is it, is it, uh, there it is. There you go. All right. Um, let's see if we can do the sound here. concepts of how an electrical barrier works. Essentially, you want to have two electrodes in the water. They're set at different voltages. A fish can have a reaction. The reaction can range in from uh, mild behavioral modifications, such as they'll sense the electrical field and just go the opposite direction and get out of there, to full mobilization. And full mobilization is when the electric field is strong enough to interfere with their muscle movements, and they have to, they, they cannot uh, voluntarily move their muscles. So in that case, they sink to the bottom or float to the top, depending on whether or not they have a gas bladder. The main difference between AC and DC is um, all chain current in the United States is 60 hertz. So that means 60 times a second, it goes through this cycle of dual polarities, whereas pulse direct current has one polarity, um, and in pulse DC, you can program it to have as many pulses as you want. Uh, the, you know, what we have learned will affect the fish best. And that's one of the main reasons this, this cost savings. You don't have to use as much power. It makes uh, the pulse DC barrier much better than an AC barrier. And this is just a little visual demonstration of an AC barrier that pulses as that point sixty per second. But you have a slower pulse for an AC barrier. So that was a very quick demonstration that uh, Jason was from Smith & Ruff had demonstrated so you could see the difference between the 60, 60 uh, pulses per second and the 3 pulses per second.
All right, so the barrier is designed to be expanded in the event that additional AIRs are discovered. Tim kind of mentioned that, and he said, uh, I think something about whether or not uh, if the goby is found to be in Lake Winnebago or not, we're going to be prepared for what is the next invasive species, if it's carp or if it's something different. Uh, the system is designed to operate in the worst case scenario for <coughs> water quality. We know that was one of the concerns that came up early in some of the in investigation and research that we were doing, and we've been working with Smith and Root now for well over, well, 16, 18 months, if not two years. And their studies show that even in heavy water, uh, poor quality conditions, that this electronic current does its job. And that the uh, pulse generators can automatically, uh, kind of like a governor on a, on, a, on a gas engine, rev up or do what they need to do to get that additional electricity through the electrodes to penetrate the water. The, this design that we're focusing on, on right now is going to directly impact the bottom 18 to 24 inches of the water column. We've got a total of 11 feet that uh, it could be. So we do know that the goby is a, a bottom dweller. They call it a benthic species. Basically, they don't have a, an air bladder in their system like our native fish do, so they automatically sink. They, don't, they, they do not have the ability to regulate their their, uh, I guess, position in the water column, other than just by swimming. The USGS has done a couple of different studies about um, prey, uh, so they like to eat uh, what they like to eat. So they'll put the, you know, the small minnows or whatever it is that they want to eat in the column above them, maybe eight inches above them. And the studies that we've been researching or looking at or basing our tech off <coughs> is that they won't even go up eight inches off the bottom of the uh, surface of the river or whatever it is and in these studies could be anything they won't even go eight inches out of their way up in in the water column to pursue prey that's directly above them <coughs> so that should give you kind of an idea of uh, some of the conditions that they're they are looking after for their habitat Redundancies, did you have a comment? Uh, some of the redundancies built into the design include an extra long channel. So we said that this is going to be 100 foot long. It's probably twice as long as what it needs to be. But this is, you know, a conservative project, so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to, to deter these goby uh, from entering into the Lake Winnebago. There's also backup power. Uh, we've got a couple of different systems that we're going to be looking at. One is the uh, gas generator, and there's also a UPS, which is an uninter uninterruptible power supply, which is basically battery packs that would cover that slice of time between when the power, just line power goes out and the generator kicks in. There's a little bit of a gap there. Maybe it's 30 seconds, maybe it's 45 seconds. During that 30 to 45 seconds, we would have continuous coverage using that UPS uninterruptible power supply that's designed to kick in as soon as there's a power, power failure. All right, so I got another video here. I want to show that to you. Let's see if I can get to that. Here. Nope. I want to talk about some of the features of the design so far. First of all, and probably most important. Do you Windows speed?
gap period between blackout and when the generator starts. And so we would install a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, into the system to power the barrier during that gap period. The other thing that the system has is a computer that sends out a, uh, a signal. If there is a problem, we send out an alarm. I send out an email or a text message to whoever the receivers are telling you that there's a problem. Let's say the generator didn't start. So if somebody needs to get down to the, uh, the barrier, you can check the battery of the generator or whatever, and get it going. In the meantime, the uninterruptible power supply is still operating the barrier. So these are all redundant backup systems to make sure that the system doesn't fail on this problem. We have a lot of redundancies in the system as well to make sure that um, you have uh, consistent operations. Uh, I mentioned already the extra long but Fuel is basically twice as long as it really needs to be, but um, that's uh, engineering conservatism into the design there. All right, we'll jump back to the slides here. All right, so that was Jason Kent, and he was just describing uh, some of the redundancies in the system so people understand that, and I think that. That's a very important concept so people understand that there are redundancies that are built in. So even when the line power, which we're enjoying here tonight, goes out in the case of a storm or a blackout, we would have an uninterruptible power supply already there that's going to be going. And then to back that up, we have the generator, which is going to run off of natural gas. So the system is... is you know, there's a couple different redundancies there that's very important, and we're just concerned about it being fail-safe as the next person is. So, you know, these are the steps that we're taking to make sure that people feel comfortable with what we're doing and that we feel comfortable with what we're doing. Tim mentioned a little bit earlier about the 60 different uh, unmonitored entry points in Lake Winnebago. We call them <coughs> vectors or entry points, whatever you want to call them. Um, we believe that we're being more proactive in, in a whole bunch of different ways and making sure that we're doing everything we possibly can do to keep the Gobi out of Lake Winnebago. So much more than probably what has been done in the past and what is going to be done this summer out on those 60 different vectors and uh, entry points into Lake Winnebago. So I'm sure some of you have maybe even stood out on the landings and checked or helped check or help educate people on what they can and can't do when it comes to trailering away with weeds on their boat or emptying uh, with weeds on their boat or if they're going to be emptying, emptying their live wells, right, or their fishing buckets and all that stuff is great education. But right now, really, it's on your honor. So... Um, it's up to people to police themselves for the largest part of this. So we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that there's nothing coming through at all at the NASHA from the, from the lock standpoint. We need everybody else to do their part on the rest of those different vectors. And I would <clears throat> have to say that if you look at it from the historical perspective, when, when the Gobi was found in Little Lake Butamore, we had three locks that were closed and at least two and a half to three miles of canal that were pretty much dry. So uh, we do know that by talking with other people that Gobi has been used as a bait fish. We do know that Gobi's been very, um, how do you want to say it? good for the bash fishermen and the walleye fishermen in different areas of the state. And it is possible that somebody could be using goby as bait in inland lakes. And it's only a matter of time before those goby get off the hook or get out of the bucket and get into the lake. In fact, you know, we don't have the study. I can't show it to you tonight, but uh, Tim did mention a little bit about some of the Michigan lake or the Michigan lakes, inland lakes. And if you look, they do have a, a map, and that map does show that all the inland lakes around Lake Michigan are infested with round goby. So somehow they're migrating inland. 
But we all know that they don't walk over land and they're not very good at flying, so they're probably getting in there by other means. So really, you know, what we don't want to do is create uh, a divide with anybody. We don't want to create a divide between fishermen or, or boaters or any other recreational users. What we want to do is, is bring everybody together and figure out what can we do to better address this situation for the long haul for Lake Winnebago and for everybody that's involved in this, while at the same time reestablishing navigation. And that's really what the focus of this is because um, it's very important that our, our riverways remain open and free for people to use. I think we have an obligation to open up obstructions so people can get through the river, get from one lake to the Fox River and, and navigate that like it was intended to be. So our next steps, uh, we did submit the DNR for DNR review, a plan which is completed at 60%. That was $150,000 that was spent. If it's approved, uh, immediately we could start um, plans for construction beginning in 2020. Um, best case scenario is, is that happens. Worst case scenario is that we, we keep on having to prove that this technology is efficient and effective and that this is the right way to handle this situation. So what can you do? What, why are we having these meetings? If you're interested in supporting the cause, what are some things that you can tell people? Where can you direct them? What do you want them to do? What, what do we want you to do? And I'm, I guess between Tim and I, what we've come up with is, is uh, educate people. You know, and be supportive of what we're trying to do. We've got a lot of people that are lined up already saying, no, maybe with some wrong information. Maybe not understanding exactly what the studies say. Maybe not being able to just have an open mind, per se, and, and interpret the information that we've spent, you know, in this case, a couple hundred thousand dollars developing and understanding. And uh, we've researched it to the nth degree. These studies have been conducted, they've been vetted in, in the journals, and they've, uh, you know, it's not like this was a middle school student that was doing a study. We're talking about peer-reviewed peer journal studies. So this is how scientific information gets passed on and it gets adopted as, as something that's legitimate. So um, can these studies be replicated and duplicated? Yes, they can, but there's additional expense there. And we feel that we've met uh, what we need to meet to make a decent uh, case. And if you look around us, and we've mentioned this before, we've got Minnesota, we've got Michigan, Illinois, and Iowa. All of them have electronic barriers. Wisconsin is sitting right in the middle, and we don't have any. So this will be the first electronic barrier in the state. So I, I guess with that, we did have a stack of cards. I must have already passed them around. If not... Um, They'll be coming. Here we go. On the front, we've got a picture of the Menasha Lock here, and on the back, we've got some phone numbers, some important contact phone numbers. So I did also pass around a sign-up sheet tonight, and what we're looking for is uh, first name, last name, and email address. What we're going to be doing is compiling a list of names that we can use as contacts to reach out to when we are developing information, when there's something to share uh, significant about the Menasha Lock Barrier. We're going to try to send something out every four weeks so people get updates regular, regularly so they can talk to, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to the people that you know that own boats, that like to go fishing, that own property up and down the river, and see if we can't kind of coordinate, you know, kind of a, I guess, a group of people that if we need to um, be present and be accounted for, that we that we're lined up to do that. Because, you know, when it comes down to it, it's going to come down to, I think, and I'm speaking just for myself, where, where the support really lies. So, got some questions. Sure. I, I have a three-point question. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 
One, I, I don't know if you reach out to the fishing community. We did. But, but that'd be great. Yep. And secondly, I think this, like many projects, uh, in their design phase, they work coming out of the gate. But the long term of monitoring, maintenance, making sure it works is critical. To that point, s some of us, not all voters, but myself included, um, for years I've driven a twin inboard 28 foot liveaboard, a big heavy pig. And so if I'm coming out of the gates this way, the nature of the river is to try to fill up that trough um, maybe 150 yards out <coughs> from the lock. And if I were leaving the lock and there's no boats coming in, I'd stand on the throttles to get up on plane within the first 100 feet. My prop wash inevitably blows a lot of dirt and mud back towards the locks. And I think this, this plan sounds great. I think it's extremely well thought out. But I think that enforcing a no wake within a couple hundred yards of that area would make a big difference. Because I don't know, and Dave will speak to this. I learned it from him. Um, you know, when I got 460 horsepower standing on it, coming out of it, I have no idea. But I'm, I'm up on plane before it gets shallow from the natural wash of the water, of the river. And I think that if you could preclude people from doing that, it's not going to push mud and silt back into the critical area to support the uh, obstruction of the building. Right. Well, there's currently a 200-foot funnel wake zone around the barriers, around the boundary of every lake. So that should, that should already be, that, should, that is the case. But it's not marked. It's not marked. It doesn't need to be marked. It does for dumb voters like yeah, for, myself. For around <laughs> here, yeah, people it needs to be say, overmarked exactly. all the time. And, and that's easy to accomplish. It's sure, things. it's, it's yeah. something, it, that's, a, that's a great yes. thought and something we yes. hadn't thought yeah. about. Yeah. Well, you're right, there should be a sonal we really need to turn it out before you enter. All the way, because you fill that part up where you're putting with mud and silt, that's good. Realize, to realize that this barrier takes care of boats going downriver and upriver, yeah. and it's the upriver boats we really have to be concerned about, because the upriver boats are going from contaminated water, in theory, to clean water. When you're coming the other way, you're going from clean water to contaminated water. I think what he's saying is, when he's leaving to come home port, oh, he's, blowing um, he's blowing silt into it. I got a big that. water jet that could yeah, just he wants blast to make sure that through that area. And, and I'm stupid, I drink when I boat, but I do it. Really? Really? Yeah, I, so, I might as well tell the So what he's saying is that he just wants to make sure that yeah. himself and the other boaters that are coming back this direction know so to not be up on plane, not be at full speed to help alleviate a problem of silt obstructing your... Back we, yeah, your so, so you know, this channel that Jeremy talked about, this 100-foot channel, uh, one of the provisions in it is that there are no cracks, there's no roughness, because the Gobi will stick to those kinds of things. Uh, we're also building the channel so that we have uh, condition at, at the downriver end of it where we'll have to periodically put stop logs in it and, and dewater it and, oh, really? and clean it Sweet. And, have it, and have it cleaned out so that there isn't anything in the channel. The, the I think it's a marvelous idea. I don't mean to come across oh, I understand negatively. That. Oh, I, I think the no weight thing is a good, good thought, frankly. Yeah, um, first, I commend you for everything you've done, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of invasive species uh, in our waterways. But my question simply is: Has since the round goby is a bottom feeder, and sturgeons are bottom feeders, has there been any study ever about if the sturgeon? would eradicate any round gobies that come into Lake Winnebago because the sturgeon are hungry and they are bottom feeders as well as the round gobies. When you when you look at the current literature, starting the ground goby first appeared, the 
west end of Lake Erie in 19, uh, 1990. In a period of five years, he expanded throughout the entire Great Lake system. We found the entire Great Lake system. Initially, when you look at the literature and what the literature talks about, the first 10 years basically talks about who the goby is and how he behaves and what, what you can expect. The second 10 years, or the second 8 to 10 years, gets involved with looking at how do we control the goby. The last 7 to 8 years now, there are studies that show that the goby has become part of the food chain for things like sturgeon and walleye. There is an indigenous sturgeon population in Lake St. Clair, which is the lake between the west end of Lake Erie and Lake Huron. They, the, the Michigan DNR has monitored that, that sturgeon population for the last 10 or 12 years. Initially, it didn't appear to have any impact. Now what they're finding is the sturgeon are bigger and they're eating them. There's a recent study that's less than two years old that shows that the round gobies, the round goby population on an annual basis in that lake changes almost 70%. Some of that is die off. They, they just flat die. The, the, other, the other thought is somebody's eating them, you know, and they think <coughs> it's the sturgeon, and, and we know that the bass eat them, and walleye eat them. So we're fairly confident there are at least two studies that show <coughs> that the sturgeon population in Lake St. Clair has not been affected. And that's I'll, one of the pushback from the fishermen. Pardon me? It's, why all the pushback from the fishermen? Well, you know, it's, it's not a good thing to say, but, you know, every group thinks the river is their river, you know? Yeah, and it's really all of our rivers, and it needs to be used, and that's our concept. And, and we honestly think we figured a way to make it work. I guess my point is that the sturgeon, bass, and walleye are finding this to be a delectable delight. <laughs> What's the issue? And to that is, Fair. what presentation did you guys do last week that got the sound bites on TV? Was it the same, same presentation? Pretty much. Okay, because the sound bites that were heard on TV were the negative fishermen. Well, well that, that, that not hundred percent effective. Yes. We're hundred percent against. Now, if, I, if, I'm, if right. I'm listening to yeah. what you're saying here, yeah. and that's what the TV presents. Mike didn't. Uh, the gentleman that represented himself on the TV sat through that entire presentation, and he was interviewed at the very end of the presentation. And that was after he had spent time talking with Dr. Rose, myself, and Jason Kent. Um, and we've explained it, to, just like we explained it to everybody here, which I'm sure you understood that there's an uninterruptible power supply that hits that gap between the line out and then the generator kicking on. So we did cover it. So, so that's so then we need to, why isn't there any press here? Why isn't there any well, TV? Here? Well, let's, let's talk about I what mean, we, how, Why was the TV there? Let's talk there, about what, we're, what we've been trying to do. There's some guys that have Let me give you questions. Questions. Oh, can, can I, can I answer this question first, and then I'll come back to you? I'm a boater, 100% behind the locks open. But from a fisherman's perspective, what they're scared of, the goby are invasive, they're voracious, they go everywhere, as you said, they live on the bottom, eight, you know, 12 inches of water. They will make their way up the river. They and, will make their way up into the marshes. And they and they will get into Lake Winnebago. Mm -hmm. And they we will. We're mm -hmm. absolutely confident and that's And they will happen. eat the eggs of the sturgeon that spawn up in Shack, and they will eat the eggs of the walleye that spawn in the marshes. As they are in Michigan and right now. Well, the volume of water in Michigan is a little bigger than the Wolf River. And so what I'm saying is, you don't want them coming in and taking over the river and eating the sturgeon's eggs. Well, I don't, think, I don't think there's anything in the literature that says they feed entirely on sturgeon eggs. Oh, no, no, no. But they eat whatever they can. Well, they... So every fish, fish does. Every fish does. And if you've ever been on Little Sturgeon Bay or anywhere up there fishing whitefish, and you put a lure down, the, the majority of what you see down there is round goby. Exactly. So they multiply. Well, they multiply. They, as I say, they, they occupied the whole Great Lake system in yeah. five years. So imagine the mass of water, the, the volume of water you're talking in the Great Lakes versus the Wolf River. And again, I'm 100% for opening the locks. So I understand that. I, I, I'm not a fisher, uh, but but I do have a question. 
when they said that three miles or you know however much of the canal was empty, yeah. but obviously the goby that made it up here was not through the stream. It was through oh, yeah. other boats and the overabundance of boats that are going to be moving around our fishing boat. So if their argument is, well, we can't open the locks for whatever reason, and A would be if the uninter uninter uninterrupted power source went down, well, the, then you just shut the locks down, would be my answer to that. But then do you close 59 of the other points of entry into Winnebago and say, well, so then what's the difference? Right. Oh, that I'm would not be my it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that's their side. Well, okay, and I get it. Okay, I was just and, curious. And we understand. You, you, you have both brought up very good points, and they're very soluble. And if you look at it from the standpoint of worst case scenario, you know, people want to. You just if you don't know, you're gonna. You could rev. You know, you just panic. You just panic. I don't know, so we're just gonna say no. But if you look at some of the literature that's been, you know, the documentation, the studies that have been done in Lake Erie and some of these other places that Tim has been referring to, it does show that there's been strong growth potential for the walleye, for the bass, and for the sturgeon. And you're all right. They are prolific breeders. Um, but, you know, from our standpoint, and Tim made that uh, comment about this is all our river, and uh, we do have an obligation to maintain the riverways open and free, and I believe that that's, you know, well stated in a couple of different areas. So we want to make sure that, you know, okay, so, we shut down Menasha voluntarily. Why wasn't the, if you use that same rationale, what, what about the rest of the landing all the way around the lake? And if, and if you're not gonna look, from the standpoint of just looking at it logically, how can you tell one area, no you can't, but let everybody else say, oh yeah, no problem. You know, and I echo your concerns, and that's why we've doubled back on this technology and it's taken us two years to research and live in the world. So, sir, you had a question in the back? More of a statement of anything else. When it comes to public education of this issue, okay, I, I know people look at me, where's this guy from? I moved up here years ago, bought a boat, and I boat up here quite regularly now. Originally from New Jersey. Jersey. Yes. No. <laughs> no. We never knew that. With, yeah. that, being, with that being said, I'm also. New Jersey, by the way. <laughs> Actually, first time I had the boat in here, it still had Jersey registration, and I got stopped. But I'm also formerly a long haul truck driver full time. And I don't know how many people in the summertime drove to the Pacific Northwest. But us as truck drivers, we have to go through way stations or we. we we have to go through more checkpoints <laughs> effectively than most people realize. When you go to Pacific Northwest in the summertime, you find right in rest areas, right in some way stations, in fact, through Montana, South Dakota, Oregon, Washington State, that not only the semi-trucks have to come in, but any vehicle towing any kind of boat. The, it, everything from a little, a little kayak that you row to to, to the big commercial haulers hauling the big, you know, Grady Whites. Yeah. You have to go in these things to get them inspected for invasive species, whatever their problems are out there, because people do trailer their boats. Imagine that. Yeah. My point is, at what point, if, if you don't, if we don't, as a group, educate the public, you're going to start seeing things like posts that I've seen on Facebook where you have cameras taking pictures of boat registrations going in and out of, I don't know where that was, but somewhere up north, where you have cameras taking pictures of your registration, your license plates, to see, to monitor whether you are washing on site or not. So if you don't educate the public, you're gonna get the negative backlash where your other 60 vectors, as you call them, we call them boat ramps. We call them vectors. But, okay. but, but, a Jersey translation. but at what point is the public going to stand for being literally monitored by some form of law enforcement at a boat launch? So if we don't, if we don't educate the public effectively, you're going to get them cameras like they got up north. The analogy that I would give you to that is, and I'm old enough to remember, uh, back in the 60s and 70s when people were throwing junk out of their car on the highway, 
and you could get the, the cops could stop you and ticket you for doing that. It still goes on to today, but not at the level it was going on at that point in time. And the reason for that is the public decided that was not the public's best interest. And that's what it's going to take here. What we'd like to have from all of you, if we need it, is if we get into a situation where we're going to have to uh, talk to people in Madison, the governor and those people, about why it's important to get this thing open, we're going to need some public support. It can't be the authority. The authority can lead the way, but everybody's going to have to pick up a phone and take one of these cards and either call his office or send him an email or send him a letter talking about why it's important that we get it open and the fact that, in all honesty, we think we've done, done diligence, beyond done diligence in this thing. And it's a question now of really not being able to say conclusively, hey, we're going to prevent the Gobi. We can't say that to you because we can't control it. But we think we can control what goes through the lock. And that's our responsibility. The rest of the responsibility, very frankly, belongs to the DNR. It's their regulation. They need to police it. And they need to make sure that if there are people that, that offend it, that they get stopped. So where are we at today? I understand that there's a proposal in front of the DNR. There is. That is, are you OK with this, or are you not? No, no. This is, this is the actual 60% design phase. If they come back to us and say, hey, you can go ahead and do this, we're prepared to do the other 40% and, frankly, dig a hole. So it, it's on the DNR for a yay or nay at this point in time? Yay or nay or something in between. When are the public hearings for that? Because usually they there are. We assume there are going to be some. And they haven't told us that yet. Yeah. And that would be the point where we would want to rally public support. Right. And, and if, it, if we get to a situation where um, we get involved with, you know, two camps of thought, it's going to be who, who talks to people in mass. Those are the people we're going to have to talk to about. It. Have you been aggressive in reaching out to all the fishing communities? To tell you where we are with this, we passed the 60% the plan to the DNR on the 28th of, of April. Since that time, we've been to Madison to talk to all our local elected people, our assembly people and the senators from this part of the world. We've had a meeting with the local government people, the mayors, the county execs, those kinds of people that border on the river. We had a press conference, and that's where all this stuff that wound up on television came about. And then we had a meeting with the fishy people to sit down and, and talk about where they were and and explain to them what the, the barrier would do and, and all the things we've tried to talk about tonight. Now, we have other engagements. We're going to Fond du Lac to talk to the folks in Fond du Lac, the voters in Fond du Lac. We're going to do that in Oshkosh. Our hope is we can, we can make some disciples. We're going to need your help, we think. And it's, it's to our benefit and to your benefit to get together and make sure we get it done. <coughs> One of the chief concerns that, that I think Jeremy and I both have is that, that there's a lot of, of misconceptions traveling around and, and comments being made that you can't, you can't support with the current science. And if, if we're going to push this issue, we need to push it from the standpoint of this is what the scientific fact is as we know it today. It may change two weeks from now, but today this is what we know. And this is why we're out here trying to get it done. What's your, what's your uh, gut reaction in your meetings with the fisher, the fishing groups, and your uh, and the local mayors and representatives? Uh, the only, the only really, um, the only really group of people who, who raised much issues with us were the fishing people. And the, my observation of that was that we put on basically the same kind of presentation to all three groups that we talked to, and that initially we had people sitting in the room from Wall, uh, what are they Wall, 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 W
and they were they were pretty uptight. But when most of those people heard what we were talking about doing, we got some positive response from them. That this may work. We're not totally against it. That kind of thing. But our concern is they feed on one another, and and they keep pushing it, and that. That whatever whatever comes out of this from the standpoint of information is accurate information because there's been a lot of inaccurate information that's come out. Uh, the fact that that uh, that the Gobi has has caused fish populations in Lake Erie to be diminished that's just not true. And both the, both the Ohio DNR, the USGS, all those people will tell you that. So it's important that, that, that we get the correct information out, that people understand what's going on. But again, I want to come back to that one point, and that is we're not saying to you that if we build this barrier, we're not going to have gobies in Lake Winnebago at some point in time. We honestly believe we will. But we want to make sure that we didn't contribute to it. That we did everything that could be done with the, local, with the current state of the science. Yeah. <coughs> what can we do? Uh, what, what does what does the authority need us to do as far as calling, showing up? Well, when, well what we intend when? to do with you is if you'll sign that sign up sheet up and give us your email address, we're going to keep you informed as this thing rolls out through the rest of the spring and into the summer. And if we need to, to conjure up some kind of process in Madison, then we're going to put out an email and ask you to contact your local legislator or the governor or the head of the DNR, or the DNR committee, to make sure that they understand our side of it. I don't know if you lost or more cast here. I don't know who the state assemblyman here for Appleton is, but Dave they should, Murphy. Dave Murphy. Mr. Murphy should be on here as well. He's a member well, here. Well, he's, he's a member here. Yeah. We actually he's been told. Right he, we he's been told. on the situation, and, and in our estimation, is supportive of it. Sorry? We met with him and he's supportive of it. Who, Murphy? Yeah. Hello, Roy Kester. Uh, Roy, Kester, Roy Kester wasn't there, but Roy Kester had his chief of staff there. Yeah. So we're Roth, assuming that that Roth. message got back. Roth, I think Roth's on our side of the yes. you know, You know, these people are put on a fence, you know, and it, it, may, it may come down to which, which wind is blowing the hardest as to which way they fall. But we get nothing but positive responses from those people when we talk to them. I don't know, they may be giving the fishy people the same positive response. I'm going to stop. Pardon me? We had some contact with Amanda Stuck. I felt that she and Amanda Stuck in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I felt we've, that she's really on board for promoting the law. Yeah, we've, we've talked to all of the local senators. There are five of them that, that are involved with communities on the river. And we've talked to all eight of the assembly people over the last two years. And, and we will continue to talk to them. But this is going to take some, this is going to take some support from all of you to get this done. There's no question about that. In, in a relatively short order, Mr. Chairman. Well, it, 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 our our real concern right now is we did not get any definitive answer as to when the DNR would get back to us. Now, is that going to be two weeks from now? Is that going to be two months from now? We just don't want to light the fire yet. We want to see what they how they respond. And then if we need your support, we're going to come to you and say, hey, we got to get this done in the next couple of weeks. We've got uh, Mr. New Jersey back New here. Jersey's got a question. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly. That's my nickname, buddy. Ugly question. You mentioned about Madison and the different senators here you were just discussing. Any kind of politics, you have lobby groups. That, that's what you guys what? are. <laughs> OK. <laughs> who, who, I guess for lack of a better term, who, other than you see generically people that fish, by the way, I do too, um, who's their lobby group that's, like, in other words, who's fighting us? Who's putting who's money enemy? behind <laughs> fighting us? Like, I legitimately don't know that answer. That's why I'm asking. I got, I got a question. So, follow up on Jersey here. Um, hold on, hold on. Okay. Did you guys talk about funding this for $3.8 million, right? Yes. Okay, has anybody else funded anything to contribute to you on either side? No. To fund it, to say, you know what, we want to keep the Gobies out, or we want to vote? No. 
So you guys are funding this all together. So the people that are out there yelling and, and screaming, kicking and screaming, haven't, haven't given have, you nothing. Yeah, they don't have a skin of the game. They don't have a skin. And that's an interesting thing. I hate to say this. We don't need your money, but what we need is your skin. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you need to have a part of this thing. Well, well said. I don't have to say it. It's called sweat equity. So and it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. But that's just my point. I mean, we got people, we got people, we got different groups talking about different right. things. And that's fine. I support money, both sides. Yeah, our concept about the money is this. When, when the authority was formed, we were given the money that the core had given to the state to put the locks in a state of, of repair that they could be abandoned. We also got other money. And then we went out, the, the, uh, the core of engineers said, we're going to put five and a half million dollars on the table if you can raise another five and a half million. We raised 3.8 million and the state put in the other million too. That 3.8 million was raised with the concept that it was to open the locks, to get the system working again. We're willing to commit that at this stage of the game and not have to go out and come to all of you <coughs> and say, we need to have you stick your hand in, in your pocket. We'll probably come to you on another issue and ask you to stick your hand in the pocket. But at least at this point in time, the board has said, we're going to stand up, we're going to put the money on the table, and if we can get it done, we're going to get it done. Period. Do we have any idea how many Gobies are in the system? Gobies? Yeah. In this, yeah. Just out of curiosity. We have no idea. Because humans are really good at eradicating species. Um, so let's say we decided that at a yearly tournament where there was no limit to Go catching these fish gobies. Fish. Uh, and then restaurants started putting them on menus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, you, know, you, you laugh about that. In two <laughs> years, we could probably eradicate <laughs> gobies in this water system. Well, the problem is they make four or five times a year. Yeah, that's our problem. But you get people out there that, let's say we do $10,000 for you know, a bounty for who can collect the most poundage, tonnage of gobies. I guarantee you that this entire waterway would be filled with any sort of floating object. <laughs> with you know the lines. reproduction rate, right? I, I, I do know the reproduction rate. You're never going to take care of it. Yeah. However, humans are, like I said, humans are really good at getting rid of Species. So, well, well, you know, testing, eradicating species, and you have Bobby Life Matters signs. Right. Hey, Jersey, we got one social membership open. I'll sign for you. Now I know why you keep him around. As a, just as a comment, uh, we spent a fair amount of time talking to people in Michigan. At the Michigan DNR and uh, actually the yeah, gentleman who's yeah, responsible for the at U.S. Geological Survey for the what they call the Lake Huron Basin, and uh, his comment to me was that you know they started they, they found first in Lake the Western Lake <coughs> here, and I grew up in that part of the world, and they got through Lake St. Clair and they got into Lake Huron, and there's and as boaters you may know there is a, a Sheboygan, Michigan. And at that point, there's a lot there. Yes, there and, the, and, the, and the, the Michigan DNR asked to have the lock closed. And they closed the lock, and the Gobi got beyond it. And when you look at this map that Jeremy's talking about, about where the Gobies exist in Michigan, you can look down here at, at really at the St. Clair River and all the way around the whole circumference of the state and the whole part of the UP, there are, there are gobies there. And there are now gobies in lakes in Michigan that have no tributaries into the Great Lakes. So they've just kind of fanned out and taken over. That's more trailers and bait birds. That's right. That's where they're coming from. That's where they're coming from. I just I just have one. Sure. 
knowing that they're going to end up in Lake Winnebago, regardless whether the lock opens or not, couldn't you save three point eight million by just waiting a year or two? We thought of that, and, and it would be a problem for us, but I think it'd be a real problem for you all. If we go another couple of years, we're going to become the Appleton Pontoon Boat Club because that's all we have. Yeah, there's, there's, there's going to be one more. There's going to be another invasion that comes up. Yes. So this is the the whole idea behind this is to come up with a solution that's not going to cover just one species, but hopefully future species that are going to try and invade us. And that that's the whole idea behind this. And Scott, I just applaud their approach because we all know you can't fight city hall, and they're taking the right approach. Well done, guys. Thank you. And y'all, y'all, if you sign that, sign up, you'll all hear from us. I promise you that. Hey, Jersey, even though you're not a member, I'd like to welcome you to the bar and have a couple of cocktails. <laughs> we, are, we are in a meeting. Jersey, this is guys. And your friends. <laughs> Yeah, you still have I don't know. 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 I